Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Simon Wyatt. I'm a partner at Cundall, leading our sustainability and net zero carbon programs. And today we're going to be doing a webinar on um, the adoption of the GLA's whole life carbon um, guidance. This was written uh, a couple of years ago by the, the team that's gonna be presenting today and formally adopted by the GLA in March of this year. So all major schemes that are going through planning in London now need to meet these requirements. And we're gonna be doing a series of webinars, standards explaining how to do an assessment and, and what the, uh, implications of some of the benchmarks and tools are around uh, development in London going forward. So Sarah, if you go to the next slide. So joining me this morning is um, Chan Lee, uh, who leads the Whole Life Carbon team in Cundall and was the lead author of this publication. Sitting him uh, has been Sarah Linnell throughout uh, our Whole Life Carbon journey. And uh, as part of our authoring team, we obviously wanted to bring in the experts. So we brought Simon Sturges, who's renowned throughout the country as one of the leading experts and embodied in whole life carbon and has written a lot of international and national guidance on whole life carbon and embodied carbon. You go to the next slide. Just for those of you who aren't familiar with Cundall, um, we're multidisciplinary engineering consultancy now working globally in 21 offices. Uh, and what's particularly of interest around um, sustainability and net zero carbon is we've been on a very long sustainability journey for the last, um, since our inception 40 years ago, but really ratcheting up over the last decade when we became the world's first uh, one planet endorsed uh, company uh, by the Bioregion on the World Wildlife Federation. And last in 2020, we became carbon neutral certified across our scope one, two and scope three business travel. Uh, on our sustainability journey we're still striving to do better and one of the ways we do that if you go to the next slide is through our sustainability cornerstones uh, where we focus on ourselves as an organization and try and practice what we preach through our workplaces introducing things like the well building standards and net zero carbon across our portfolio uh, working on some amazing projects with our clients but one of the areas where we've particularly focused over the last years has been industry leadership and this piece uh, looking at whole life carbon and writing standards for the wider industry has been something that we've really concentrated on and worked collaboratively with the rest of the industry you go to the next slide um, and one of the key uh, collaborators we've worked with over the last few years has obviously been simon sturges who's um, known for being one of the lead authors on the RICS uh, professional statement for on whole life carbon, our author of the RIBA embodied in whole life carbon, uh, currently leading the whole life carbon network and the rewriting uh, of the RICS guidance. Uh, and we obviously wanted to bring him in at the beginning of this process to help us do the GLA uh, guidance on whole life carbon. And he, he was uh, heavily involved in the authoring of this documentation. As I said, this is going to be a series. So this is the first of three presentations. First one on understanding the process and methodology, then going into a bit more detail in the second one, how to prepare an assessment for the GLA. Uh, and then finally looking at some interpretations of the benchmarks and going through a bit more questions and answers. In terms of questions and answers today, we will, we're trying to leave about 10, 15 minutes at the end to go through questions. So if you do have any questions as we go through, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and also, I'd just like to remind people that we are recording this and it will go on the website once we finish. So I'll hand over to Sarah to do um, an introduction to Whole Life Carbon. Great. Thanks, Simon. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I will just be giving a high level overview of what whole life carbon is. We don't want to assume that everyone joining the call today um, understands all of the nuances of that. Um, so I think the first place really to start is we often talk about tons of carbon. Um, and really, that is just such an unknown entity unless we compare it and um, apply some carbon equivalents. So um, for your interest this morning, one ton of carbon is the same same as um, three 13 inch MacBook Pros or a hip replacement or even a quarter of um, your average city car. Um, so if we put that into building terms, um, a building might have between 10 to 20,000 tonnes of carbon in it. So that's 10 to 20,000 hip replacements. Um, so yeah, we're talking about a large magnitude and often we talk about um, 
the construction sector and the built environment sector contributing um, 40 percent of uh, carbon emissions so really we have an opportunity here as people who work in the built environment sector to drive down carbon emissions so we know why it's important but um how how on earth do we get to a world which is net zero carbon well the world green building council brought out their roadmap for a Paris aligned built environment, stating that by 2030, all new buildings should have um, net zero in operation and 40% 40 le 40 less embodied carbon than at the point of writing this document a few years ago. Um, and then by 2050, um, to have net zero whole life carbon in new buildings. Um, so we're talking about these two terms here, operational and embodied carbon. Um, and for those of you that aren't aware, Essentially, um, a lot of the buildings following building regulations or business as usual um, would have maybe majority of their carbon imp impact coming from the operational energy side. Um, so during the lifetime of the building and, and the embodied carbon side from all the materials and investment um, of products into the building um, maybe would contribute like a third or less. But what we're seeing over time is as the um, electricity grid, certainly in the UK and many parts of the world is, is being improved um, and therefore the impact is reducing over time and efficiencies and equipment, um, therefore the operational carbon contribution is reducing um, so therefore the embodied carbon contribution from materials and products is becoming more important for us to focus on so that leads to this uh, question of well okay if embodied carbon is really important then what what has happened um, over the last 10 years and this is a timeline that just indicates back to 2011 but actually understanding about embodied carbon goes way beyond that and um and definitely some on the call today have experience of of first-hand understanding what embodied carbon was before most of the rest of the world knew um so in 2011 um the um BSCN 15978 um, standard came out, which set up um, a methodology for consistency of how you calculate um, whole life carbon and embodied carbon. And then in 2017, six years later, um, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors brought out a professional statement, which then interpreted this, interpreted this a little bit further, um, made it more digestible for those of us in the built environment sector. And, and then really, as you can see on the timeline, over the last handful of years, there's been this increase and in uptake of um, guidance and documentation that has been brought out throughout different aspects of the industry. Um, for example, various institutions commenting on embodied carbon and what that means for their proportion of the sector. Um, and, and that's really led to the introduction of the GLA's whole life cycle carbon assessments guidance uh, initially the draft came out in October 2020 um, and then in March of this year uh, the final document came out so that's obviously what we're talking about today uh, but this timeline just shows a little bit of the journey over time so yes yeah, so it's these two documents which are a few years apart so as I mentioned, how, how do we get to net zero? Well, this is just one school of thought. So the UK uh, Green Building Council brought out their whole life carbon roadmap back in November, 2021. Um, and this roadmap considered both embodied carbon and operational carbon. And a few suggestions from um, this working group suggested that, well, for embodied carbon, in order to bring that down to net zero, well, we need to regulate, um, we need mandatory measurement of whole life carbon. Um, and part of the GLA introducing this um, need for whole life carbon assessments for referable schemes is linking to that. Uh, but but further than that, then the building regulations need to move towards limiting up, upfront embodied up front embodied carbon, not just simply measuring it, but then limiting it. And then finally, applying um, carbon pricing and anti-carbon leakage policies, almost a tax on those that aren't um, really achieving it to help us all drive down. Um, and in terms of the operational side, um, that is then making 
energy disclosure mandatory um, using performance rating schemes. Um, those performance rating schemes, again, like the embodied carbon side setting minimum standards um, and and yeah, finally adopting energy use intensity compliance. So there's these two sides um, that are leading us towards hopefully the same goal. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Simon Sturges, who's going to talk a bit more about how we actually minimize uh, these greenhouse gas emissions associated with embodied carbon. Thank you, Sarah. I'm hoping you can all see that. Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk about minimizing some practical steps that come out of um, within the uh, whole uh, the GLA uh, SI2 guidance. So <clears throat> at the top left there, you can see uh, where we were in 1990, where there was zero uh, percent emissions reductions, where we need to get to at the bottom at 100 we need to get 100% reductions, i.e. net zero, by uh, 2050. <clears throat> so that's the creates the diagonal. And you can see there <clears throat> the Act of Parliament 2019, and then you've got the Act of Parliament, in fact, that's 2021, which said we have to have 78% reductions by 2035. And at COP26, um, it was said we had to have 68% uh, reductions by 2030. And you can see those all essentially saying the same thing. And therefore, to be above the line is uh, outside of this, and below the line is is, is within this. Um, which means that buildings that we are completing this year should be slightly better than fifty percent where we were uh, in um, uh, nineteen ninety, or indeed even maybe about twenty ten. So it gives you an idea of the scale of where we should be. And of course, we're probably not because most current new build schemes are in that sort of zone there. Uh, at the moment, and even a, a really good scheme is only going to be at the bottom end of that. So um, in practice, um, if you look on the left there, you've got a column which is, if you like, the total, represents the total uh, lifetime emissions of a, of a new building. And you can see to the right, as you sort of step down in sort of uh, so 20 to 30% at a time to get down to 2035. So that's looking at 78% reductions. Now, what we've known through experience is that about 20 to 30% of those reductions can be achieved right now today without doing strange things. This is using today's supply chain uh, and also, as you can see, they're cost neutral. So we can make already, we can make significant gains. And I think the expectation is that as this moves over time, that as we get closer to 2030 and 2035, that we will get um, better innovation and so on. So that, that this will improve. And then ultimately to get to net zero, you may have to, um, uh, offset. So this is what um, uh, this diagram here is the sort of picture over time of um, what carbon emissions look like. So each of these bars or pair of bars represents the aggregate to that position. So if you look on the left there, you've got the green, a big dark, you've got the tall dark green bar, which represents the immediate construction emissions. So those are the big hit right at the outset. And then as you go on to the right, uh, the blue bar increases because over time, obviously, you've got operational energy being used and this is aggregating it up. And then, of course, along the top there, you've got the pale green, which is the embodied emissions from repair, maintenance and so on. So you can see that the initial big hit, as Sarah was sort of talking about, is to do with the, the construction, the initial emissions, and that over time, the operational emissions catch up and, and indeed this is overtake. So um, I'm just using this one quickly as, a, as an example of uh, this is a, a big housing scheme with schools, business park, and so on. Um, and this one is um, uh, a scheme where it's in two phases, which is not untypical for something of this size. But the point is that because of the nature of that diagonal I've just shown you, phase one has, if you like, less demanding um, carbon targets than phase two. And you can see the residential at top there, 625 for the first phase, and then further down, 2035. Uh, by 2035, 450. So this is a, a, a changing situation. So um, I'm going to now take you through the sort of 16 principles that we set out uh, in the GLA guidance. So the first of these is prioritize reuse and retrofit. Um, and I show this example where I'm comparing the, uh, new, the, the proposed new bill for Marks and Spencer and the uh, retrofit scheme. And the thing is today is that because of the way we're designing things and because of the way we, the, the extent of knowledge, um, even a, a, a very good, and, and this building is, is, is a low carbon building on the left, um, 
it's still nothing like as low as doing a retrofit. So retrofit is where we should be prioritizing as much as possible. Um, the next one uh, is use repurposed or recycled materials, um, which is a sort of a similar idea to retrofitting, but just on a small scale. So this is giving you an example of, uh, of two sorts of an uh, aluminum finish. On the right there, you can see anodized and then powder coated, both silver, silvery gray, very similar. But the difference is, is that because of the um, uh, fact that you need to have uh, a uniform aluminium substrate to anodize, um, you have to really use virgin aluminium, which comes, this happens to be a bauxite mine in Australia. But of course, but if you use powder coating, you can use recycled uh, aluminium. So even some uh, fairly simple choices like um, the finish can make a big difference on whether you're using able to use recycled material or virgin material. Um, third item is make low carbon material choices. This shows two buildings, um, which are, if you kind of like, uh, exploratory in this in this in this area. The one on the right is made of cork. The one on the left is a uh, part of the uh, University of East Anglia, and it's got um, uh, thatch cladding, uh, which you might think, well, that's not going to last very long. Well, if you think about um, the aluminium windows in there, the life expectancy of a double glazed unit is probably about forty years at best. Well, the thatch is probably going to last the same amount of time. So these things are not quite as crazy necessarily uh, when you start to think about them. Um, item four is minimize operational energy use. Uh, this is a theater by Hayworth Tompkins, which is entirely naturally ventilated. And of course, the benefit of going this route is that you're not only having to uh, not, uh, obviously avoiding putting in the uh, uh, central plant, um, uh, but you're also avoiding having to replace it every 15 to 20 years. And indeed all the subsidiary things like fan call units and so on. So you're getting, not only you're getting a benefit in operational day-to-day -day energy use and, and associated costs and so on, but you're also getting better in terms of uh, embodied costs in, in not having to continually replace plant and things. Um, minimize operational water use. This is probably fairly uh, obvious. I put this one in because of course, one on the right, the picture on the right there is showing you uh, the kind of leaks and things that happen, which are firstly wasteful in, in, in terms of um, uh, water, which of course has a cost, um, but also damages the fabric of a building, and um, which means has attendant problems, costs, and, and embody, uh, further embodied costs. Um, item six is designed for disassembly. <clears throat> this is, um, I'm going to show you another slide, look, which looks very similar, but I'll explain when I get to it. But this is uh, <clears throat> about um, ensuring that the components that go into your building have a future value. Um, and indeed, you'll probably realize that when you build a building like this one, say the value is not so much in the materials once it's complete, it's actually in the <clears throat> habitable space you're creating and the square meterage that, that, that associated with that. Now, this building is a, a Segro building um, that was actually dismantled. So it was not designed actually for disassembly, but it was dismantled. And I'll finish the rest of that story in a minute. So um, item seven is ensure efficient building shape and form. Um, and this is sort of self-evident, but it also applies uh, to both operational energy and embodied. So it's typically known as uh, wall to floor ratio or heat loss form factor. So the building on the left will probably win all the architectural prizes, but the one on the right is going to be more efficient in terms of the number, of, uh, the amount of materials required in closed space, but also in terms of heat loss and, and so on. So, there is a so this is all about efficiency, you know, good uh, simple shapes and so on. Um, item eight is regenerative design. This is probably looking into the future a bit, but if you look at this diagram on the extreme left, it's kind of where we are uh, today, which is conventional minimum me meeting min minimum standards, which is sort of basically a, de a, de a degenerating situation, if you like. And even uh, a second sort of column uh, along uh, green high performance. So even good buildings, you know, very green high performance buildings are gonna be still on the de degenerating side. Meeting net zero is in the middle there. And then as you go towards the right, this is really about buildings that actually, if you like, absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or have processes. And typically today, the most obvious example of this is having a lot of planting in your building, which will, will absorb a certain amount, but nothing like what's needed. And, and uh, so you can see this is, 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 as I say, future gazing, but it is, there are already ideas about this coming forward. 
Um, designed for durability and flexibility. So this is a fairly simple and obvious example. This is a, a pretty classic standard Victorian terrace house. And we're all familiar with this where endless different variations, uh, you walk along the street front and they all look the same, you go on the back and people have done in incredible uh, different changes and alterations to this, which is a testament to the, you know, the, the, the original uh, typology in that it was able to um, be fully flexible and so on in the future. And this is an important point. I know that certain people uh, design, I think Canary Wharf contractors make a point of um, designing their office buildings such that they also sort of, if you like, uh, uh, figure out how they could be turned into residential in the future. So they've got a, a, an idea about how they might change things going forward. Um, item 10, <coughs> optimized relationship between uh, operational emissions and embodied emissions. So what this is about is, um, and this is, I'm using the example of insulation. So Typically, when we choose something like insulation, we're principally concerned with the U value, and, and this would be applied to the makeup of any facade. Um, but we really would also be thinking about the uh, carbon cost of that insulation and indeed the life expectancy. So, in, in this case, the insulation on the left has about roughly 10 times the carbon footprint from the uh, natural fiber on the right. Um, the issue, of course, then is to check that is the life cycle of the stuff on the right. Uh, suitable is it you know it, it, it gets wet and rots then obviously that's no use at all so it is really a question of thinking about all these three things this together um define building life expectancy now this is something that i find very few clients actually do which is to say we want this building to last a certain amount of time and i've shown these two facades to sort of illustrate this point and on the left there you've got a substantially brick facade which of course is capable of lasting probably at least 100, maybe 200 years without difficulty. Um, and the windows may need replacing from time to time, but fundamentally the majority of the facade is it will stay intact. The, the facade on the right is of course a unitized uh, 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 curtain walling system. This one happens to be a double glazed unit with a third sheet on the outside creating a cavity. And that has a very high embodied cost. Obviously you need all that to reduce the air conditioning load. But of course, the uh, life expectancy of that facade is probably again about you know, 30 to 40 years, at which point it'll need replacing with, with all the attendant costs, not only in terms of the lease issues, but of course also the, um, the embodied costs and, and so on. So, you know, it, it is a question of what is the life cycle efficiency? And it may be that if clients started to really put in what they expected buildings to, to last for, how long, and for a tall building like the one on the right, or for either of those, in fact, a century is not an unreasonable proposition. What does that mean in terms of the design? So um, source local materials is, a, is another key one. I've, I've shown two um, sort of very obvious ones, which couldn't be more local. Um, but uh, I think it's, 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 it's about a range of issues. Typically with your main contractors, they like to use the um, uh, supply chain that they're familiar with. And so pretty much wherever they build, you'll get the same subcontractors being pulled in, but actually, Quite often you will find that there are local suppliers, local subcontractors, which if the um, main contractors can be encouraged to uh, search around, um, it'll reduce things like um, uh, traffic loads on uh, uh, and transport costs in terms of um, diesel use and so on. But also it, it is a positive aspect in terms of contributing to the local economy um, and has certain sort of planning benefits from that. But it does mean that contractors have to be sort of encouraged, as I say, in this direction. Um, 13, item 13, minimize waste. This is an important one. And really you want to start on the left there, which is eliminate. So you want to avoid producing waste in the first place. Um, so for example, very simplistic one might be if you have lots of cut bricks, well clearly you're gonna have a waste. Uh, if you can avoid that kind of thing, well then that's gonna be a lot better. Uh, and then you want to uh, minimize the waste if you can't uh, eliminate it. You want to minimize it as far as possible. Um, and then if you aren't going to be able to do that, then you want to be, en enable reuse. And in the case of bricks, for example, um, clearly if you've got um, something like, if you're using say lime mortar, you can scrape that off and reuse the bricks in the future as a brick. Whereas if you're using cement mortar, typically you can't do that. So the brick becomes sort of uh, rubble under a motorway or something. So you want to try and enable it to be reused in, in the future. So that's a sort of disassembly thing, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and again, recycle, can it be recycled? ultimately uh, disposal and how do you opt to make that as uh, as, as efficient as possible. Um, 
14, use efficient construction methods. Um, and this is all about things like uh, 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 you know, how you assemble buildings, the modularity, and enabling, again, disassembly uh, and uh, modular construction. So on is obviously a key part of all of this um, and, 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 and how you how you can and deal with that. Um, uh, use lightweight construction. Um, this one is, um, uh, and you'll probably notice that some of these, in some cases, would appear to conflict. And in a sense, that is the role of the designer to sort out the best of all of these. But the point about using lightweight construction is really to, again, to minimize things like um, transport uh, uh, impacts, but also things like reducing foundation and, and structural costs. Because if you've got very heavy construction, um, uh, then of course you have increased foundation weight uh, and, and mass required. Now you probably say to me, you know, thinking, well, you, I've just said well, use bricks, which are heavy. Well, as I say, this is the sort of thing we have to reconcile. And uh, if any of the easy answers, well, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. So um, design finally to facilitate a circular economy. So as I say, this is the sort of flip side of this. So having disassembled your building, you then can reassemble it somewhere else. And in fact, on this building, which we did exactly this, we moved this building about a mile for Segro from a sort of unattractive place to, 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 to rent it to somewhere that was much more desirable. And they had been proposing to demolish the building and throw it away and build a brand new building on the new site. And we persuaded them to actually disassemble it. And they're able to reuse, I think it's about 70% of the materials and, um, they were also able, and it, that, it, the overall costs were down by 25%. And I think the, the carbon costs were down by about 60, 70%. So this was absolutely a, a viable thing. And of course, if this building had been designed for disassembly, we could have improved on all those figures. Um, so uh, I'm, that's finished for that. So I will relinquish. Thanks, Simon, for the uh, introduction, uh, for the previous slides. And what I'm doing here is the last session, last part of the presentation will be going through the, the process and methodology we defined in the GLA uh, guidance. And also there's some, some detail we'll be mentioning here will be covered in our uh, follow-up uh, seminars. So again, this is to, to a little bit recap on what is covered in or what is required in the assessment. This is the, the diagram from the whole life, whole life carbon network and not redefining, but aligning the, the, the names, com, naming conventions of what we, what we call different modules and what we call the carbon associated with them. So for example, the upfront carbon refers to material manufacturing, transportation, and also during the emission during the site construction. And also we try, we're asking, this will be including anything pre-construction, the demolition, modification of its inside, etc., And also in use, you need to, this is, that's what you consider the replacement, repair, and also off-gassing of the materials that can be accounted for using uh, default values at design stage. But this gives you indication of how maintain, maintenance impact, how refurbishment impact will, is, is having based on your design decision at the early stage. I saw a question earlier just but now about the such rule, which is again, this is kind of this principle, how often you need to maintain or replace that material and your decision will be affected by that as well. And also like Simon said, the way you design, the way you construct the buildings will have an impact of end of life and either to demolish the building or how if you can repurpose those materials ease, then the, the, the construction and build methodology Will have a direct impact on those elements. What this also asks you to do is produce a module D estimation, which is how was impact of repurposing and reusing of your building, and also what is the impact of you basically remove or, or downgrade all your material to landfill or the waste. And basically, this it asks you to report all the emissions associated with demolition and with waste treatment and also potential benefit of recycling and reuse of material. Again, that's fitting quite nicely with the circular economy principles and guidance the GI also um, published recently. Again, what was mentioned is op optional carbon, also not especially part of the calculation here is calculated by the MNP consultant using DM65 or SAP calculation for residential buildings. 
and water emission, we need to include those emissions as part of the calculation just to form the completeness of the assessment. So when we started the writing the guidance or proposing the guidance, we identified, okay, where are the key stages we need to be involved as a whole life carbon practitioner and, and what are the key areas or key stages of the inference. So we will identify what we need to do. And we, uh, we map this against what GLA is, is capable of regulating or GLA is, is a capable of regulating or, or legislating. And we, so we agreed, so those are basically three steps. So they, at the pre-planning stage, which is voluntary, and you can produce a pre-application questionnaire, or you see that that's exactly the same 16 uh, criteria someone explained earlier. It's like a quick checklist to enable you to make sure you have considered all necessary steps and haven't missed something obvious, and using the checklist to be part of your pre-planning pre -planning application meeting with, with your uh, local council or with GL, with the GLA to, to make sure all the early decisions are captured. And then next step is roughly at RBSH3 or, or, or late stage two, when you, when you want to submit a either outline or detailed plan application, you need to perform a um, relatively more detailed whole life carbon calculation using either a default value or using a more uh, precise value depending on how much data you have for your calculation. Then the, the number you produce or the, the result you generated Will be will be compared to the benchmarks we produce for GLA. I think what's quite important is is what we're trying to do to make sure the data is consistent and also to make sure this has been enforced throughout the construction. The idea is, or the, what what was actually being implemented is the there will be conditioned a post completion update using as built material quantities and as built energy emitted during the site construction and the waste information to update the uh, whole life carbon assessment submitted at design or planning stage. Again, this needs to be using the verify using the, the as built quantities and also explain the, the differences, uh, either improvement or, or, or sort of increase of the carbon values. Again, this is just is for one is for people to make sure they, they collect data during construction and also to make sure GLA will have a very robust set of data. In the future, they might choose to legislate using the data set received. So as we mentioned before, we produced the first draft to end of 2020 and the, we began through the draft and consultation, but made some update based on the so useful comments received. And there's a few key things to mention. And the first is they made it quite clearly the intention of this policy is to prioritize refurbishment and the retention of existing buildings where appropriate. It's to stop unnecessary or just to demolition by default. Again, do you think that the, 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 some other buildings Simon mentioned as an example, there may probably a, a, a more thorough study or, or a more comprehensive assessment how retention is feasible will need to be had for similar cases in the future. And also between 2020 and now, there's lots of useful guidance published. For example, the structural engineers published the uh, how to calculate body carbon, and also uh, PM65 from CIPC give you guidance on how to calculate body carbon for MEP elements. And those are being referred or be referenced in the document as well. We also produce a mandatory list of MEP elements where it's applicable. You need to include a minimum in terms of your uh, assessing your whole life carbon of, of your projects. Another removal of this is, is to we simplify the template to, to, to reduce reporting burden, just make it more automated. And also assessment tool, which uh, we use to ask you to report another scenario considered a great decarbonization which is not mandatory anymore. Again, the part of the reason is that the grid scenario changes every year. It's hard to maintain consistency between of projects between the years. And again, because the raw data is submitted, it's quite easy for GLA to, to have that data set if they wish to just apply the reduction factors. 
and also the benchmark values. And again, we had a lot of working group with LED, RBA, and GLA, and to align the carbon values or the, the benchmark values we were using. So again, so there's some minor modification, some, some number goes up, some number down in terms of the, the whole life cycle carbon emission benchmark to make sure all the organizations or the key, at least key organizations are using the same set of data and same set of benchmarks when we compare to each other. So again, as I said, local authorities will, will need to secure post-construction assessment by conditioning or through legal agreement with the applicant. And this assessment need to be completed within three months of uh, practical completion. And again, the document sort of heavily referenced the uh, RCS purpose statement and BSEN 15978. But there's some slight differences again because again, that was one is produced to 11 times moved on and new regulation came in at, and so the, the one of the key things is often energy need to be assessed as a BSIN requirement in the GLA guidance using TM65 or SAP for domestic buildings and module B is this need reported and pre-construction demolition included as well. And again, if you don't have the data at planning application stage, there's uh, some, some benchmark values in the, in the guidance we included for, for your reference. So again, we, we, we were talking about the process. And again, it's, it's, as I mentioned before, at the beginning, or you can, you, 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 you can choose to have a pre-application meeting, uh, sort of uh, as all um, some big scheme normally do. So you can, as part of meeting, show the, the council or GLA the pre-construction carbon questionnaire and also the, the checklist rather, rather to say what we've done in terms of minimizing or lowering body carbon. And then you're using that principle grid, and then you, you, you develop your design, you, you verify your options, then you submit your uh, application either in the outline or detail stage. Then post construction, you need to be uh, be complete. Will be be submitted as part of a be condition, and you need to do that within three months of the completion. So the template again, we the the you know, wants you to do in Excel because it's easier for them to store store in a database. Also, there's a circular economy guidance policy SI seven is heavily linked and uh, interreferred, ref, sort of interreferenced between this document. Again, the lots of principle are the same and even the requirement and the, the data needed are the same. So hopefully there's not much too much data uh, added to work for complying with these two documents. So if it, we, as I said, we we're gonna give uh, another seminar about the exact process and what to look out for and what people are, re the review process of this is focusing on. But again, I'll just go through some more brief slides about the process. In the, again, at pre up stage, this is the question there or the list I mentioned. This is also the key benefits and the principles. You provide your answer if you've done it or it's not possible, and, and the reason for those. And in the outline or detail stage, you can do a more comprehensive study. You produce your answers and you compare that with the you know, type of building you choose. You, you have your uh, benchmark to compare against. Then again, that give you a, a um, say how, how well or badly you're doing compared to benchmarks. So post completion, again, it's the similar form, but it's using a as built and more realistic data uh, based on exact justification, exact transportation distance, et cetera, of your building. So again, in terms of building elements, um, slight difference. This is, I um, think LETI and RBA say, uh, sorry, LETI say the actual work probably not is part of their, their target value, but Nevertheless, the, the, the GLA wants you to report everything in, in terms of completeness. So to make sure that the data are all captured and all the values are reported. So again, the template asks you to report them in different categories. And they just, uh, if you follow the template, that's a uh, the assessment is should be complete. And so I'll hand back to Simon and to have a few uh, questions and also um, keep some dates for the other uh, upcoming seminars. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, as I said at the beginning, if people do have questions, please put them in the chat uh, questions and answers box and we'll get round to them. There's already a few coming through. Uh, there's a functional one. Um, 
where can we find the checklist? Chan, where is the checklist available at the moment? Is it on the GLA website? It's on the GL, GL website. You can see there's a there's so called template. There's a link on the document. You can see see the document, but actually there's a one link below. There's a called template. You need to go back one step and find the template. So it's all on the all on yeah, the website. All yeah. On the website, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, there was an interesting question to start with, which I think Simon's already gone back on, but it's probably worth having a bit of a discussion um, around both the durability and fire requirements of some uh, low carbon solutions. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, timber buildings, thatch. Uh, how how do we consider the durability of some of those where they're external, and how do we consider the fire implications, both on fire engineering and also on insurance. Both of them are very hot topics at the moment. I mean. Shall I have a go at that? Yep. Um, so the first, but yeah, the, the, the answer to the thatch and lifespan issues, um, obviously thatch is typically used as a roofing material, <laughs> but as a walling material, um, it is obviously much more vertical. And uh, I, I, in my answer, I said, well, I, I live in Suffolk, there are plenty of thatched houses around the place here and 30 to 40 years is not an unusual uh, life, I, I don't believe. But on the bigger question of, of timber structures, um, this is something that um, certainly I know there's been of concern to the um, Select Committee on, on who's been looking at whole life carbon, which is that insurance uh, is a big issue. Um, and at the moment, there's a, a, a an extra premium, if you like, on timber buildings, which is Unfortunate because those who who know the people, fire engineers and so on and architects who are very much involved in timber construction and design <coughs> reckon there's really no you know if done correctly and properly there is really no reason why a timber building should be any more um, dangerous than than any other structure um, and in some cases it can actually be preferable um, but of course the, the, the Grenfell fire has created quite rightly a lot of concern. Um, and we need to make sure we get this right. But, if, but it, I think the main problem is also in the UK, we're just not used to de designing timber structures of, uh, as a regular thing. Uh, whereas in Europe, um, uh, certainly the Netherlands and, 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 and Finland and so on, there, there, there's a, a much bigger tradition in, in designing timber structures of several, you know, quite a few floor uh, stories um, properly and well um, that are not dangerous and so on in fires and they don't have the same sort of issues with insurance so this is something that um, is of concern but uh, I, I think we shouldn't over overestimate the problem. Yeah I think, I think that's very true and I think what we've seen especially over the last couple of years has been fire engineering solutions have come about so the fire officers are generally happy the insurance seems to be the tougher nut to crack but it's moving in the right direction uh, obviously there is some reluctance because of what has gone on in the in the past in the UK but hopefully it's moving in a in a positive direction another interesting question I think this is one of probably the 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 main questions when we're talking about whole life and embodied carbon it's how do we factor in the uncertainty at planning stages for example we don't really have bills of quantities EPDs manufacturers data so how can we be certain of the quality of the assessment I think um, sorry if I protect that and in terms of the um, what we're trying to do is I mean you basically when people before people um, build this building or there's some financial assessment that must be done to make sure the building is, is financially affordable I mean when you calculate that there must be some way of estimating that the of how much material would need so there are certain way like cost council estimating estimating the uh, the the cost data I mean again the, the, the whole life common or the, the structure engineers or architect can get some estimation in terms of Structural or facade area, etc. Using typical build up so there's some default value you, we have to use. And also, what we've seen is, or we're trying to encourage is, you're building some contingency. Say this is I'm um, less less certain about say the MEP. I probably I will apply twenty percent contingency if it's I have got better understanding on the facade or substructure. I might only have five or even for the for a minimum contingency. So you need to build like a cost. Again, you're referring to the cost consultant, the, the building offer sin or building allowance for this to make sure you, you can, the building, you, you're allowing adequate sort of a, a carbon value in, in the assessment. 
And also what we're trying to, to do is if you say, oh, I looked at the facade, trying to sort of whatever scrapping of the facade based on the on the cost, and then the cost allowed in, in the cost plan of the facade is they say 30% more. That means there's a 30% gap between your estimation and the real uh, bill material. So again, that's where the where we suggest the contingency can be referred from so that the, your estimation and different in the, in, the, in the cost allowed. So there's a the differences you can apply a uplift factor to to justify that um, uncertainty basically. Yeah, I think yeah, like you say, I think it's it's you don't need to go to manufacturers data. There's enough good quality databases now, especially through things like eTool and one click. Uh, and then there's also EPD databases. So I think there's enough generic data or or reasonably uh accurate data that we can use at early concept stages. Um an interesting one which we're seeing more of as well is how do labs and mechanical uh, and med tech buildings fit into this sort of regulations? Um, so the question really is, uh, most standards that we've been working on have been focused probably on commercial offices and, and residential, uh, but the, in the UK at the moment, we're focusing very much on life sciences and tech buildings. How uh, are they factored in? And there's a second part to the question talking about Tim, 65 uh, which they're saying is quite challenging obviously it's fairly new so uh, it will be challenging but it will be getting better so any any thoughts on that Sarah on how we deal with different types of building typologies that aren't normal yeah I think to be honest it's um, the step one is measuring it if, if we're not measuring different building typologies, then we can't build a picture of, um, of what their carbon impact is. And I think we're always um, going to have a level of uncertainty just to kind of touch on the previous question. Um, and, and so over time, um, as people are investing in whole life carbon assessments and, and doing their own embodied carbon assessments and it's helping to build a picture. Um, so one example, I know that the Department for Education, um, part of the guidance that they have made on all of the new DfE education schemes is that you have to report whole life embodied carbon at RUBA stage four and six. But you might say, well, that's that's too late because, you know, your contract is already onboarded, you're already building on site. But actually, the, the reason for that is because they're trying to make that compulsory across all of the DfE schemes so that then they're able to build benchmarks to inform um, future targets and limits for educational buildings so I, I think that that is starting to happen across different building typologies and I think in terms of industrial buildings I know even in-house we're starting to build our own picture of, of what that looks like and um, I know other consultancies are doing the same and I think sharing this data through the GLA then helps to inform um, those wider benchmarks I know there are other groups of people doing similar like Letty and the Whole Life Carbon Network so I think it's rather than kind of saying okay well we don't know what we're comparing against so um, how, how do we measure or how do we know where we sit I think firstly just um, measure all of the material quantity that's going into your development and then taking that number and using that as a reference point for next time and I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this publicity of data from different projects so I think that it will be unlikely in the future if you don't have a reference point for your building um, is my long-winded answer to that yeah I think yeah so I think on I think uh, I purposely agree with, with, with Sarah's uh, analysis that I think also, of course, th this is early days, if you like, and I think as we progress over the next few years, you'll start to find more data coming available on things like hospitals. Um, I mean, I'm working on, it, for example, some industrial units, which, of course, there aren't any benchmarks for those. But I, what I would also say is the RICS is um, putting together a database, <coughs> which will be of building types. Uh, so it'll collect assessments um, from right across all building types, um, and it'll also collect data on materials and, and, and EPDs and so on. So when that's up and running, there'll be a much better um, understanding of what your particular sector or, or typology or building type is that you wish to compare against. Um, otherwise, at the moment, I think you just have to try and if you're, you know, if you're having a planning discussion, you need to either use directly the GLA benchmark uh, figures 
or if it's something like an industrial unit, which doesn't quite appear, is develop a case for why the benchmark you're selecting fits in with the other benchmarks. Yeah, I think it's definitely a journey. In, and the point of the GLA's guidance is that this is very much a data collection, just as much as requirement. So uh, it will evolve over time. Um, in terms of the assessments, there's a very practical question, which is what what percentage of projects are currently doing these assessments and which ones do it apply to? And projects that aren't referable, should they be doing it? Um, it's not mandatory, but uh, it's recommended. We've seen a lot of cases in the mid-range projects. The, the, the planning officers are asking for those information already. So what, what which, which schemes is it mandatory for? But for the referable schemes at the moment, referable schemes like a building. So all, all referable schemes in London, in London. Is, is required by the GLA, uh, and then non referable schemes, it will be up to the local authorities, is, is key because some local authorities are asking for it, even if they're not referable schemes. Okay. Um, there's a good question. Again, it's probably taken a few steps further. So there's a question about under prediction. So how do we ensure that we're not under predicting at early stages? And again, if, if the GLA do introduce um, targets, what, what, how are they going to enforce uh, under predictions that actually are going to be larger going forward? So is there a mechanism for controlling the, the submissions to make sure they're not under predicting? Um, well, I, I, I suppose that the, the issue of underprediction is a similar one to the financial underprediction. Nobody wants to underpredict financially because it has all kinds of consequences. I think in, in the same sort of way, we've got to develop the, the kind of, if you like, the carbon intuition. And, and certainly on the early stages of a project, most QSs will give you a pretty good idea, even on fairly thin information, because they are knowledgeable about the area or the type of building you're building, the size and so on, and special conditions that might apply to the project. And so they can give you a pretty reasonable estimate and they will probably build in a contingency as well. And I think the other, th so I think one of the issues that, uh, and I think something that the next iteration of the RICS professional statement will try and address is, is this kind of problem, which is you know, ensuring that there is maybe even a carbon contingency you build in, but also that um, there's better strategic decision-making that can be made at the earlier stages. Uh, which is not just about under-reporting, although that is an issue, but it's also about um, options. So, you know, do you go the full timber option or do you go the uh, steel and CLT option? Or, or, or what is the optimum carbon and financial package or, or relationship that you can do for your particular project? Um, so I think, again, this will is something that, that will evolve. Um, obviously, at the moment, under-reporting in carbon doesn't have the same consequences as underreporting in uh, financially. But I think as these benchmarks get a bit tougher over time, this will, this will have to refine, and, and I'm sure it will with, 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 with use. And Chan, I understand that you've given GLA guidance on how to call out numbers and review so that they should be have enough uh, ability to, to, to give constructive feedback on submissions. Yeah, we, we've done sort of trainings with the planning officers and energy officers to, to guide them through what to look out for. And also they also GLA employ professionals to, to, to check those, those values. And also one, one other written thing um, that they want this older application assessment to be third party verified when applying. So again, there's another level of warranty, a lot of assurance uh, to be had. And also the post-completion update is another key verification because if, if you use this much material for uh, and then be verified by the cost and the contractors, then that's something you cannot lie or cannot uh, omit. Because that, that's if you have a big difference in design stage and post-completion, there's a sort of pretty bigger problem in the next verification, uh, the next updates of the GLA documents. Question here on, uh, in addition to the guidance, what digital tools are available for designers? I know as part of the review, Chen, the team looked at uh, a number of software tools. Is that summarized anywhere in the documentation? In the document, there's a list of uh, available or the tools that are available at the time. But we, we, we understand new tools come out on, the, on a regular basis and people develop their own ones that might meet the certificate requirement. So the tool is not ex ex sort of a exclusive. It's just say those are the ones we think meet the requirement. And also the tools, 
someone to be, be, be reckon they need to update certain areas to make it more compliant. And so if you have a facility, if, if your tool or whatever software you're using is meeting the requirement and can cover the necessary modules, I think there's no reason you can't use it. Even using your own spreadsheet, you can, as long as you do it properly using the correct data set, rather relying on a tool, it just doesn't, it's not, the tool is not, it's only a, a, a one part of this. Using a right tool doesn't really keep, mean you have the right assessment. It just, you have, to have the right knowledge and, and the process. Yeah, it's a mixture of the tool and the data. Uh, just time for one last question. I think it's quite a good question to finish up with. So the focus seems to be on London, the London plan and the GLA. Are other national uh, bodies likely to follow London? So are we seeing other councils look at it? And probably that's a good time to introduce um, part Z and where, where that currently sits in the moment and trying to get it introduced into the building regulations. So I'm to go first and then Chan come in on that one. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so firstly, part Z, um, part Z was launched um, in, in Parliament of the House of Lords about four weeks ago, when I say launched, it, the idea was launched, it's not yet a regulation. But I think there's pressure, we've got, we've got about 160 industry-wide supporters, you know, big consultancy developers, investors, uh, and so there's broad support for Part Z. What we're now trying to do is get it into the, um, get the government ent enthusiastic about it, and um, as part of this um, Whole Life Carbon um, Select Committee, there will be references in that to regulation going forward. I think in terms of the country as a whole, I know that a place like Manchester, Leeds, Dundee certainly already have um, similar kinds of things and uh, uh, to, to, to the GLA. So I think you'll find that um, this will start to roll out. And I know that things like you know, various government departments, I mean, already Department for Transport's been mentioned, uh, sorry, Department for Education, but I know the Department for Transport, the NHS, um, Bayes, DLUC and all these other places uh, are all taking a, a, an increasing interest, either from a kind of um, regulatory point of view, um, as in the case of Bayes and DLUC, Department of Leveling Up and Communities, um, or as the, like, things like the Department for Transport and NHS is actually doing assessments. I think the concern I would have is that each government department decides to do something different, which would obviously be um, chaotic, but um, we'll see how we go. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a movement across the country at various speeds to adopt this as all the councils try and meet their climate emergencies. Sarah Chan, anything to add? And um, yeah, I think I think this is what Simon mentioned earlier about the we've seen local other councils outside London to 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 require information on different level schemes because they but they haven't none of them have made them in in, in a formal requirement again it's, we've seen numerous cases say okay you do one using GLA standard can you do one because they want to understand what's going on and also I think it's because more data they have the more confident they will have this process will actually work and so again they can see lots of uptake but not formally so it's come out say oh we're going to formally adopt this but this is locked it's all depending on the uh, case officer's decision yeah, I think all I'd add is that um, we're seeing more and more of an increase of this being important to our clients. Um, you know, they they have their own corporate social responsibility and therefore it's coming into their sustainable development brief. So even if the work that they are um, prioritising or their um the nature of the projects that they work on if they're outside of London um if if the client has has a strategy in place saying that you know new build offices have to be under 600 kilograms of carbon per meter squared then they're going to ensure that that is implemented because they they have to um give accountability that their projects are meeting certain targets so I think we are seeing it rolled out even if it's not formally through policy um, but I think clearly London in a way is um, is setting up a a template that can be followed by other um, authorities and other councils so I, th I think it's a, a good thing but I think um, we're also seeing the uptake in in other forms um, yeah I think um, hopefully that's fair to say. 
No, I think that's a very good point to end on. So I think what's very clear is, yes, it's it's going to be a requirement going forward in London and it's only going to ratchet up. We're going to see pretty much it rolled out universally across councils at various speeds in the UK, first reporting and then probably bringing into, into the requirements in terms of benchmarks and targets. But what we're seeing definitely in the market is a, a requirement from funders, investors and developments to move faster than legislation. So the front of the market is moving very fast in terms of looking at these assessments, setting targets uh, and, and meeting them. And if if people aren't looking at this, they're going to be left behind very quickly. It's much easier to be doing it now while there's no mandatory requirements in terms of performance requirements. If if you're calculating this for all projects and they do introduce uh, uh, performance requirements, it's going to be much easier to achieve if you've gone through the journey of calculating it and understanding how you reduce it. So the, the recommendation is, is you need to start looking at this on as many projects as possible to reduce it and, and work your way through the steps because it is going to become more and more important as we go forward and as Sarah and Simon both indicated rightly at the beginning of the project uh, the webinar is going to become more and more uh, um, important in terms of the emissions share as operational energy decreases and we decarbonize the grid in body carbon could be up as high as 70 80 percent of most new projects um, so the last thing to do is uh, obviously thank our expert panel today, they did an amazing job, and also to remind you that this is the first of the three uh, webinar series. The next one will be looking in a lot more detail at the actual submission process and taking you through how you'd submit that, finishing up with some interpretation of the GLA benchmarks and uh, some predictions about when these benchmarks will actually become targets uh, and more discussions uh, and answers as we go forward. So again, thank you all for attending and thank you to the panelists today.